Okay, so I think we are all back in the room again, um, and I am, have the pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor Jorun Pettering. She is a professor for a Latin American and Iberian history at the University of Hamburg. And um, I will also make this rather kind of brief-ish, <laughs> and um, I have again chosen a handful of publications Again, more uh, sort of um, according to uh, what sprang to my eye. So um, she has a monograph on migrating merchants, trade nation and religion in 17th century Hamburg and Portugal, which appeared with the Kreuter in 2019. Um, and I think that's the translation of the German uh, original Handel, Nation und Religion, Kaufleute zwischen Hamburg und Portugal im 17. Jahrhundert. Um, and um, there is a handful of um, edited, co-edited volumes, Konkurrenzen in der frühen Neuzeit, um, a, a volume together with Franziska Neumann and Hilart von Thiessen, which will or has appeared in 2022 or is, has, has appeared. Okay. So, um, then um, what I, I, of course, personally, as an environmental historian, find particularly interesting is your interest in water and water usage. So um, there is a, a journal article, a recent one, Paradise for Whom? Conser Conservatism and Progress in the Perception of Rio de Janeiro's Drinking Water Supply, mm -hmm. 16th and 19th centuries. In the Journal of Latin American Studies, it appeared in 2018. Another one is Water and the Struggle for Public Space, Social Negotiation in the Usage of Colonial Rio de Janeiro's Waterworks in Brasiliana, um, appeared in 2017. Um, and then we have the uh, interesting sort of entanglements sort of Hamburg and uh, Latin American um, spaces. So the economic activities of Hamburg Portuguese Jews in the early 17th century in uh, trans transversal or transversal Zeitschrift für jüdische Studien in 2013. So uh, a wide sort of spectrum of subjects and we're looking very much forward to your presentation explaining the astonishing transition from slavery to citizenship. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Very much for the kind introduction. Um, I must say I'm not a professor of history in Hamburg anymore, but I was a substitute and <laughs> this has ended by now. But um, yeah, I was very happy to be that, uh, to have been that um, professor of history in Hamburg. And what I'm going to, um, exp to, to present now is also part of the habilitation I am writing, which is about the water supply of Rio de Janeiro. So I'm in the beginning, you won't see any water, but then when I'm going into the into the sources, it is about water that I'm I will going to to speak today. And when I prepared or when I was invited, in fact, I don't know. Sarah said that she was asked not to speak about the 18th century, and I'm speaking about the 18th and 19th <laughs> century. <laughs> And I'm not sure if I ever was told not to speak about the 18th and 19th or um, if I was told and I forgot it. But so chronologically, I'm doing I'm treating another or two other um, centuries than um, the others the, um, did uh, yesterday and today. And also geographically, I'm staying in Latin America, but I'm going to Brazil. So this is a very different, um, yeah, culture, society, even if it's Latin, Latin America. And some of the things I will go to say, um, apply in a similar but different manner also to many Spanish, um, American countries. So, and I, 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 from the beginning, I started to think about the momentum of its own. So I really tried hard to talk about that and not so much talk about my own things and then at the end reply to the question if it was a momentum of its own or not. But I really tried to put into the whole thing a momentum of its own. And I'm not sure if I've... I'm yeah. After that, we can discuss if I if I was uh, successful in doing that. So in this talk, I will propose a momentum of its own, 
that describes the dynamics of socialization or Vergesellschaftung with which slaves drawn from Africa and their descendants became citizens of a modern state in Latin America. <coughs> These dynamics were effective over several generations and, as I want to argue, contributed to the emergence of the modern state itself. However, and that's the second point, Contrary to the hypothesis of the conference, and I uh, did say so very early that I didn't agree, I think that these dynamics have been driven primarily by an open and flexible social structure, a pronounced experiment, uh, experience of absence, and a fundamental dissent between the black population and the Portuguese dominated society. So it's quite the contrary of the hypothesis here. I always, put what I think was special and was also um, is very important for, for, for the working of the momentum which I see there. This is not to say that I don't, I can find the, the, the contrary. I can find hierarchy I, and uh, group orientation. I can, of course, in the culture of present, that's my, my um, weakest argument that it's an experience of absence. I will talk about it, but it's more than I think it is. Um, of course, there is a strong culture of presence. Um, I, I cannot deny, but the absence is important. And also with the dis uh, dissent and consensus, um, both were, were there. And then I think the dissent part is the more interesting, more um, expressive one for Latin America and also for what I'm going to, to argue. So... And moreover, the dissent um, makes the transition from slavery to citizenship even more astonishing. So I say it's astonishing that slaves became citizens. How did that work? And I think that if we think early on about a consensus of of all society and of slavery, of slaves inside society, this is not very astonishing that they, one day they become citizens. But if we say they are in a dissent, then it's rather strange that they will become. And to give an explanation for that, I think that the momentum of its own is important. So that there is a kind of dynamic on plus uh, of, of these things. So to illustrate what I, I just said, I will present three stages of, of the socialization process, so a long durée. I will begin with the chronologically last one, but best study stage, the assertion of individual rights by enslaved people in lawsuits. In this stage, mainly in the 19th century, in this stage, a certain consensus orientation um, cannot be denied, although it was probably not the only motive um, of the concerned parties. The second section, no, this section is, yeah, is followed by the chronolo chronologically first stage, which is the most poorly documented, but has nevertheless been reconstructed lucidly by historians and social anthropologists. And this um, chronologically first one, which I treat second, is the establishment of new social relations and networks in the violent American environment by the slaves. Here, um, social openness, um, the experience of absence and overall social dissent were perhaps most pro pronounced, though these qualities were inherently revalidated at least until 1850 when the transatlantic slave trade ended. So this starts with the first slaves being um, deported from Africa. This starts that, that we have these three qualities, which I mentioned in the first um, slide, and this will go on until the last slaves arrive and somehow get into this society, um, feel the loss of, of their um, relatives in Africa and so on. And in the third section, um, which takes an intermediate, chronologically an intermediate uh, stage, I come to the um, to the most important thing, to my own work, in fact, it, the rest is historiography. I will treat it most extensively um, and try to describe the man, um, momentum which was woven into the direction of a liberal society of citizens, 
citizens um, and this liberal society of citizens or this becoming of, of slaves becoming citizens was neither intended by the slaves, they did not want to become citizens, that was not their aim, nor by the slaveholders, they did not want to have them as equals. Um, so this is um, the astonishing process. The concrete example to which I apply um, all this is the city of Rio de Janeiro, which, although not representative for all of Latin America, at least took on a leading role it was in Brazil as its official capital. Of course, it's a city, it's not countryside, and it's, it's a special case. Nevertheless, as being the capital since 1763 officially, even before it had a, a, a prominent position as a city in, in Brazil or in Portuguese America, this has um, some importance. In total, about 5 million enslaved Africans were taken to Brazil between the early 16th and mid 19th centuries. So this is more than 45% of all people trafficked, all uh, Africans trafficked to the Americas to both Americas, inclu uh, including uh, the Caribbean. And apart from being um, Rio de Janeiro, and apart from being an important transit point for the slave trade, Rio had its own black population of a considerable size. By the end of the 18th century, when we have the first more or less reliable numbers, Rio was home to about 40,000 people, 40% of which of whom were enslaved and 55% of whom were black. In 1822, just to give the frame of the, the chronological frame, 1822, Brazil became independent from Portugal, uh, became a constitutional monarchy. Um, and in 1888, so at the end of the century, of the 19th century, slavery was finally abolished. I come to the first um, stage. Um, so the last chronologically last, or the, to the first point, to the chronologically last stage. The transition from slavery to citizenship was first comprehensively addressed uh, by Frank Tannenbaum in his groundbreaking 1947 book, Slave and Citizen, the Negro in the Americas. For him, this transition turned out to be very simple in Latin America, as opposed to the same transition in North America. According to Tannenbaum in the Iberian legal tradition, which understood freedom as a natural human condition and encouraged manumissions, ransoms and complaints in case of abuse, slavery was a contractual relationship rather than a permanent state of humiliation. If a slave had the necessary financial resources, he could put an end to his status any time. Freed slaves, according to Tannenbaum, did not experience serious obstacles to their integration into society. Thus, Tannenbaum concludes or explains, in Latin America, the final abolition of slavery took place, with, <clears throat> took place without any major resistance from the slaveholders. Only in the United States, where slaves did not have rights and where they, there existed no individual manumission, did racism um, persist. At first, this portrayal met with great acceptance, especially, uh, actually it's the same, <laughs> uh, especially among Latin American elites. Even today, some Brazilians are still convinced that there exists a racial democracy in their country in which everyone has the same opportunities regardless of his or her origin. But as countless studies have shown, many details in Tannenbaum's account are wrong, and even his central hypothesis is at best partly convincing. In fact, the violence and trauma that grew out of slavery were at least as pronounced in Latin America as they were in British America and the United States, and the racism that followed slavery is present everywhere. In Brazil, in particular, the abolition of slavery was anything but easy. In no other country in the Americas did slaveholders manage to delay the abolition as long as they did here. To be sure, with the Brazilian Constitution of 1824, individually freed slaves, if male and born in Brazil, immediately became citizens. That's true. 
with the same citizens with the same rights and responsibilities as other citizens. However, as research has emphasized, especially in the last years, freedom remained precarious. That is, it could easily be reversed. Moreover, if citizenship is understood not only as a legal category, but also as a social status, the transition from slavery to citizenships in Brazil was a lengthy historical process that has not been completed to this day. As Sidney Chaloup, among others, noted, the strict conceptual separation of slavery and freedom took place only in retrospect after the abolition of slavery in order to incorporate the state into a, the common narrative of progress. In fact, there had already been spaces of ambiguity, as he said, and perhaps freedom within slavery, while exploitative labor relations have found their continuation in modern capitalist societies. Research examining the agency of enslaved persons in Latin America has expanded greatly in the last three decades. In line with Tannenbaum, it emphasizes the centrality of legal institutions for slaves at least for those who lived in cities and were relatively well integrated. Above all, it examines the legal strategies they used in the context of manumission-related lawsuits, readily emphasizing the slaves' enormous creativity with which they tried to shape their own destiny. So these were quotes. There is, however, a clear difference between the Spanish and the Portuguese legal traditions. Among the Portuguese, the codification of slavery was much less developed than among the Spaniards. And the paucity of positive law suggests that until 1830, slave status, rather than freedom, as Tannenbaum suggested, was considered the normal state of enslaved or formerly enslaved person. This is probably one of the reasons why court cases in the Portuguese legal area began much later than in Spanish America. In Brazil, lawsuits involved slave uh, lawsuits which involved slaves did not become numerous until 1850, even though they already existed since the early 18th century. But in Spanish America, they um, exist much much earlier. In the earlier period in, in Portuguese America, uh, um, they were usually initiated by slaveholders seeking to uh, disapprove the le legitimacy of a claim to freedom. It was not until much later that slaves themselves filed lawsuits, for example, to enforce informally made promises of manumissions or to challenge the legality of re-enslavement. In the absence of written law, they invoked a gradually developed customary law, further consolidating it in this way. The slaves had been able to negotiate customary rights within the framework of the daily treatment, because the treatment included not only the whip, but also the proverbial carrot, which the slaves could hope for if they behaved appropriately. By granting such customary rights, slaveholders succeeded in keeping peace and stabilizing the institution of slavery in the long term. Yet this also gave rise to a collective sense of entitlement among slaves. And if necessary, they took legal action later on to enforce customary right. And the fact that they could refer to customary law lowered the barrier of access um, to the courts. So this was in a certain way an advantage also, but is all, of course, customary law is, it's not um, reliable. So, it's, it is unwritten and it's very hard to prove, although it's possible to prove. And now coming to the second point, um, my idea was not to change too much the slides because there are always problems. <laughs> That's why I had marked it here to change and then I put them on the same slide. So more than 30 years ago, Sidney Chaloup argued that the important 8071A Act grew out of such claims making Claims making by the slaves, also known as the Free Womb Act, um, it not only freed all children born to enslaved mothers, but also transformed several customary rights into positive law. Nas Shalup gave slaves an instrumental role in bringing about the law that ushered in the final abolition to, of slavery, because there were not uh, transatlantic slave trade had uh, had been abolished already. The newborn. People, children 
w could not become slaves anymore, so they, they paved the way for the abolition. And with the custom, with the making the customary laws, positive laws, they also, um, gave slaves legal capacity because before the slaves were, ha were treated like, um, children or women, which, who had not full legal, um, capacity and with giving them legal, uh, with giving them written rights, positive law, this change. The bulk of individual but similarly timed legal actions, this is Shaloub's argument, of slaves had, struct had structural consequences. So by going and going again with a similar um, intentions to court and asking for certain rights, um, this got structural. Many early modernists who study the emergence of statehood would, statehood would certainly agree to this, but by now I think it seems to be common sense that it was not so much uh, through the implementation of legal system from above, but primarily, primarily through the continuous demand for law and justice from below that a functional judicial system and ultimately the rule of law emerged. Taking Shaloub's argument one step further, one could therefore argue that the slaves were responsible to a significant degree for the introduction of a modern state in Brazil. But Shaloub's interpretation met with much criticism. According to his opponents, he overestimated the slaves' agency. Mm. They argue that the emancipation cannot solely be attributed um, to, to the individual dissatisfaction of slaves living in the cities, not least because otherwise abolition would have taken place much earlier. Rather, these Critics say the abolitionist movement of the 1870s and 80s brought about the decisive change in the mentality among the ranks of bureaucrats, mm. lawyers, judges, journalists, politicians, white people. In fact, the slaves were able to assert their often successful role in the trials only because they received the support of and the protection of these people, of dedicated lawyers and public institutions in general who gave them the, the space to have their lawsuits. Where this mentality of the abolitionism came from, however, um, does not yet, um, was not yet answered satisfactorily to my, in my view. Many historians would probably point to the external ex influences from other countries and from Europe, starting with the upheavals associated with the Atlantic Revolution, so human rights and all these things, apart from the fact that by the end of the 19th century, uh, slavery may have been outlived um, its economic usefulness anyway. So capitalism came and there was a kind of contradiction. So that was the principal reason for the abolishing of slaves. I would like today to uh, propose a momentum of its own as the cause of abolition, a momentum that already began in the early 18th century, although it was uh, uh, undoubtedly flanked by the mentioned developments. So, of course, the other things are also right and Atlantic revolutions are important and so on. But I think there is this momentum. Namely, I want to argue that the slaves gradually acquired a public status, repeatedly hemmed um, a public status repeatedly hemmed in by the authorities, but never completely suppressed. And this public status within the hegemonic society, which, according to my thesis, opens the way to the implementation of such lawsuits, including the recognition of the legitimacy of their claims by more and more members of that hegemonical society. Thus, I do not assume that slaves limited themselves to imit imitating the behavior and the rules of, of the game of the hegemonic society in the sense of merely wishing to be part of this society. Rather, I think that they fulfill different roles depending on the context in which they were active, and they, that these roles were characterized to varying degrees by the aforementioned momentum. The fact that the slaves were incorporated into the hegemonic order on the legal level was conditioned by the momentum on the cultural, religious and social levels, other dynamics prevailed. So there, this momentum didn't work in these other areas. That's why socially they are not on, this, on the same level as, as citizens. 
In terms of describing this momentum, I would like to know that the slaves got into the judicial buildings and jurisdiction and used them to their advantage. While slaveholders filed lawsuits to subjugate slaves who made claims to freedom, thereby restoring the established order and reaffirming traditional hierarchy, slaves did just the opposite. They consented to the institution, language, and logic of that order, but they used them to permanently quit the place assigned to them within that order. In doing so, they ultimately challenged the order itself, and in many cases they did so with institutional support. And this is the last point. By anticipating their roles as future free citizens, they forced the transition from a slaveholding society to a liberal state that tended toward rule of law. So I come now to the second um, step, which is the chronologically first stage. Um, slaves and social relations. This you need to read only later later. Um, but uh, so it's uh, just the title, Slaves in Creolization and Resistance Slaves in Social Relations, the first step. To understand this last stage in the formal um, incorporation of slaves into the liberal order, it seems necessary, as I announced, to look at them a little more closely at the stages that precede it. This is much more difficult due to the lack of historical sources. Indeed, we know little about the experiences in the early moments of the enslavement. In 1982, Orlando Patterson introduced the concept of social death as a cross-cultural characteristic of slavery. It seemed to imply that enslavement was tantamount to social annihilation. That is an erasure of personality followed by the absorption into the world of the slaveholders. So not only no, no sources, but also they were socially death. There, is, there was nothing to write down. With the forcible uprooting from their original social relations, people, according to this, to, to Patterson or to his um, description of the social death, they would also have lost their status, their belonging, and their collective memory. But as Vincent Brown and others, but um, Vincent Brown very convincingly explained, Patterson's description or his idea of uh, social death is only an ideal typical abstraction stripped of any individual experience and therefore not suitable for approaching living reality. The continuous struggle for dignity and the meaning for action of the enslaved, which in spite of everything took place and brought about historical changes, cannot be explained under the assumption of social death. So the individual, um, to the individual, social death existed, but rather as a constant threat um, to which he had or she had to react in form of a receding horizon. So they did everything not to die socially. Thus, even Patterson um, acknowledged in, in his uh, book that precisely because the kinship relations were destroyed, the slaves cultivated them all the more, or new ones, they or the few they had were extremely important to them, and that precisely because they were denied personal dignity, they fought for it all the time. Even if community building always um, had a fleeting and provisional character, slaves permanently strove to build and maintain significant relationships with their living comrades as well as with their ancestors. So the ancestors are extremely important for, for the social world. Slavery was not only dispossession, but also the continuous resistance against dispossession. dispossession. Mm -hmm. Winston Brown illustrates it with a case in which a group of enslaved women who were still on the ship um, crossing the Atlantic created space to perform a morning ride for a deceased woman. In doing so, they not only honored the deceased, but also held up their own values, and visions even demanding, in a certain way, accountability for the death. In general, the enslaved people who met on or across the Atlantic did not come from the same region in Africa. This is very important and therefore had different ancestors, had different beliefs, different rights, and often did not speak the same language. To be sure, there were some similarities at least among the Central and West African societies um, that belong to the Bantu language family and from which most of the slaves in Rio were recruited. Nevertheless, the process of community building, as arduous and further complicated, uh, was arduous and 
further complicated by the constant arrivals of new slaves. So it was not they were deported and then they built a new community, but there were always coming new slaves who did not speak the language, who were from other regions, who had other ancestors. So they, until the end of the slave trade, this happened. And others, um, either by death or by, by internal um, uh, trafficking of, of slaves, went away. So they stayed only for a short time, for two years, and then a, a, an important person went away. So this community building was extreme, complicated. Social anthropologists uh, Sidney Mintz and Richard Price referred to this process in which people from different African societies and cultures were suddenly brought together under very unequal power relations and of necessity, out of necessity created new social institutions, status systems and religious orders over the course of one or two generations as creolization. That is a very important concept here where, and I have written the definition there. This process varied according to the local situation, but was never limited to it. Uh, was never limited to the return to African traditions or direct assimilation into a hegemonic society. Rather, dynamic, a fragile cultural communities emerged, shaped not only by the experience of slavery, which was neither African nor European. Uh, so this was the experience of slavery. And also it was shaped by the absence of their ancestors. And that's where I um, was pointing to this culture of absence. The ancestors who, or I mean, then they got new ancestors, but um, the old ancestors stayed in Africa. They were there in trees, in some natural parts, in, in, in lakes. They stayed there. So this is what I meant by culture of absence in opposition to the culture of presence. According to Vincent Brown, the struggle to connect the African past with the American present can be understood as a political act, which was totally incompatible with the slaveholder political ideas shaped by Iberian tradition. Brown's concept of the political in this context is, as he himself admits, very, a very comprehensive one. The political actions of the slaves were not necessarily part of a dispute or more concretely directed against the slaveholders. Instead, they were frequently limited to us. Uh, these political acts were limited to assertions of their own social existence. Just this, we, we are not socially that. We live and to be socially um, living, you had to have meaningful relationships. Slave, I come to the second um, part, Slave resistance itself is rather, in this um, context, is rather to be understood in the sense of Michel de Certeau as, quote, seemingly meaningless <coughs> practices that infiltrate the ruling system and leave traces that can change the system in the long run, but without this being intended. Precisely because these forms of resistance were not direct, uh, directed against slavery as such, and were often not perceived as resistance, perceived as resistance, they could have more lasting and also more constructive and pluralist effects than more open forms of resistance. And with this, I come to the momentum. Not every social practice is likely to have had a social, uh, a society changing effect. So not everything we do is socially important, or is it what the slaves did had this character um, of, of society changing effect. For these other factors, when necessary, an essential one among them, according to my hypothesis, uh, can be grasped in the momentum of the public sphere. Yeah. The concept of momentum developed in, this is what I took from the literature we were given, uh, developed in the 1980s is useful to describe certain absurd processes. This is very important for me, the absurdity. A common example of such absurdity is an unintended escalation of violence. In my case, however, it con uh, consists, at least in tendency, in a decrease of violence and in the gradual integration of black people into the liberal society of citizens, which was also unintended and can therefore be described as absurd. So both 
both parties don't want this and nevertheless um, it happens. That's the absurdity. Momentum is also defined by these people in the 80s as an autogenetic reproduction of motives. That is, on the one hand, the actors involved reinforce the process with um, their actions. And on the other hand, the process reinforces their actions. In my case, I'm concerned with the latently resistant, but per se only marginally consequential everyday actions of the enslaved which gradually became emancipatory actions in the liberal institutional sense, especially in the context of the freedoms used described in the first sections. I'm also concerned with the respective authoritarian reactions to them. The public sphere, I suggest, a set in motion, uh, the public sphere set in motion a chain of reactions in which the behavior of the enslaved repeatedly had consequences that led to a more comprehensive public sphere. This chain of reactions contributed not only to the integration of black people into the hegemonic social order, but also to its transformation. Nota Bene, I said, contributed to it because I'm not suggesting that it was a, det a determinate monocausal chain of reactions. The public sphere, however, may have formed a distinctive threat of this. Definition of public sphere, the first point here, the public sphere is not meant here in, in as my Habermas in the normative sense of an enlightened civil participation. Rather, it is formed by of concrete and uh, concrete or abstract spaces that are characterized by accessibility for, or at least orientation towards a general public. Spaces in which people can communicate and gain visibility, and which are therefore predest predestined to become the scenes of political action. Getting more specific, as Respublike, no, as Respublike cities were characteristic, characterized by a set of public institutions, one of which was urban infrastructure, and now I come to water finally. And in my example of Rio de Janeiro, I want to concentrate on the water infrastructure. Significantly, in 1731, Rio City Council even referred to the aqueduct, completed only a few years before, as the most public work that, that exists in the city. In close connection with the infrastructure, public spaces came often into being, such as the space through which uh, the fountains were accessed. But other public institutions in Rio and elsewhere, such as administration, repressive bodies, the judiciary, also are also were also important instances of the public sphere in my definition. Even the communication there was usually much more asymmetric and formalized. Although initially slaves rarely fell within the purview of public administration due to the status as private property, so they had nothing to do with public administration, it was they who generally served the urban infrastructure. In doing so, however, they did not always behave in the intended manner, but appropriated both the infrastructure and the public spaces by, uh, created by the infrastructure according to their own ideals. ideas. Second definition on this slide, appropriation. I understand appropriation here in the sense of Sartre, once again, that is not as means of exercising power as Edward Said and other cultural scientists would do, but as an everyday and fleeting practice of the weak as a creative way of dealing with the space imposed by the dominant order, by those who do not have their own space. So here too, there is no consensus with the hegemonic order. Instead, there are resistant actions within this order which take place within the order only because of the impossibility to escape it. I come to the first sub-point of the momentum of the public spheres, the appropriation of the fountains. <laughs> so what did appropriation look like in relation to Rio's water supply? The enslaved and free black persons who carried the water from the fountains through the household undertook a whole series of practices at the fountains that were not in the spirit of the dominant order but whose specific meanings we can only guess at 
for lack of suitable sources. Our knowledge of them is limited to the descriptions of slightly irritated people who did not operate the fountains themselves, but merely observed what was happening there. The first characteristic repeatedly noted, especially by travelers in the 19th century, but also, but which were also true of the earlier period, was the noise and chaos that prevailed at the fountains, especially when there were also, when they were also used by washerwomen. For example, the English traveler Thomas Eubank, the first citation in 1846 about the fountain at the Camp de Santana, what a hubbub. A hot and tot fair cannot surpass it. Splash, swash, go shirts and cheating, plunged, pounded, twisted like a rope, swung overhead and flap, slap, down they come upon the coping. A score of these songs are whirling in the air at once, wielded for by infuriates whose laughings and screaming interjections break the monotony of the ceaseless gabble, gabble at the font. End of citation. To this... This chaos or this um, noise were added quarrels at, uh, that often flared up at the fountain. Since the aqueduct was put into operation in uh, 1723, the city government felt compelled to take action against the bickering, bullies and unrest dependencias at the Carioca fountain, which, um, the, so the, the aqueduct went to this fountain. This was the first fountain. Soon injuries and deaths are mentioned in the document that would occur if uh, without a guard being posted. The physical danger here was not for the white population. Rather, there was fear that the black water carriers would attack each other in a dispute over the order in which they filled their vessels, apart from the fact that the fountain and the aqueduct could be damaged. There was repeated talk of violent clashes at the fountains in the reports of foreign visitors. They formed a constant topos um, well into the 19th century, century. What were the causes of the disputes? Most water carriers probably worked under great pressure. This was especially true for those uh, working as so-called earning slaves, who sold the water they carried on their own account and had to deliver a certain amount of money per day or week to their owners. Since many of these um, want to set aside additional money um, for their ransom or for the ransom of another slave, this pressure increased. In addition, there were ethnic conflicts which had already often already existed before the displacement from Africa and which were instrumentalized by the slaveholders in America by deliberately bringing together um, people from different origins. As the governor of Rio de Janeiro explained in uh, 1726, experience had shown that the differences of nations, um, this was a quote, were the most efficient means of preventing insurrection, nation being the term used for the ethnic groups as uh, perceived by the Portuguese. I come to the second quotation, a French traveler who stopped in Rio de Janeiro in 1748 explained that the Portuguese joined slaves from the Guinea coast, that is the Bay of Benin area, and the kingdom of Angola who hated each other. De manière que ces deux espèces étaient mêlées partout et ne se conciliaient jamais, l'une ne peut rien entreprendre que l'autre ne la décèle aussitôt et la sûreté pour publique est fondée sur cette antipathie. Mm -hmm. uh, that is to say, the, the public security is founded on the antipathy of, of, the, of the nations. The Irish clergyman Robert Walsh even reported that the black population of Rio de Janeiro in 1828-29 was composed of eight or nine different ethnic groups united neither by a common language nor by mutual goodwill. This led to feuds and fights that often involved a hundred quotation or two, even 200 members of one nation on each side. And here is depicted one of these many struggles around the fountain. So the fountain is here. There are two guys um, struggling here. There is chaos. There is noise. <laughs> Almost five minutes. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you.
I'm, I have to think. Mm. That is totally overthrowing. I mean, you, I mean, we do have some time space, I would say, but we do, do have no, yeah. time for discussion as well. So. Yeah, yeah, I, I, um, I, I agree. <laughs> mm, I just have to concentrate now what to... Take your time. So I think these are struggles over rank, which they do. So they construct also over rank. I mean, there are several reasons for the struggles, um, but it's um, also over rank in the new newly built African-American environment. Um, and the spaces at the fountains uh, are invite to have these things. In fact, I have a lot more to say, so I really should um see what to say i then wanted to say that it can also be um a place of um peaceful exchange peaceful political exchange of um what they were talking there probably and then i wanted to co come to an incident in the year 1727 um interpreting these fights in another way um, because, well, I can't go back to the manuscript. Um, Governor, Governor Luis Vella Montero re uh, repeated that during a temporary absence of the guard appointed to protect the Carioca fountain, it had not dam it been damaged more than before. The only thing he had observed was that black people were gathering to play. Se ponen todos a jugar on a small earthen ground, the tejero, pequeño tejero near the fountain, mm -hmm. and from this distraction, the disturbances grew. It is possible that this play was a form of Jogo de Angola, a precursor of the martial dance known today as capoeira. Mm -hmm. Probably many of you know capoeira. According to historian Carlos Libono Suarez, the dance was capoeira, this fight dance was probably developed by earning slaves as early as the 18th century in Rio de Janeiro, although this, although this is a very early incidence of it, on the basis of Central American elements. On the one hand, it served as, served as a pastime, but at the same time, it gave the practitioners the uh, opportunity to practice techniques of mm -hmm. attack and defense. And here I also have an, a quotation and a... No, this is... This is, I also, um, this is uh, by the person we already know from yesterday, Murat Rugendas, and this is his uh, depiction of a capoeira, and he describes, it. here is the German citation I translated into English, much more violent is another game of, so now he's coming to speak of the capoeira, is another game of the Negroes, Jogar Capoeira, which consists in, um, one trying to knock the other down by headbutts on the chest, which they avoid by dexterous sidesteps and parries, by jumping at each other almost like bucks and sometimes running violently with their heads against the, each other. Here it happens not infrequently that the joke turns um, serious and bloody heads or knives put an end to the game. Perhaps um, this fighting simulation was much more often hidden behind the unrest, which I uh, mentioned before, or with the, uh, the sources mentioned unrest at the fountains in the 18th century. Despite the crudeness that uh, Rungenas um, explains here, Capoeira represented an important, this is a quotation of a historian, an important symbol of African culture in the, 18, in the early 18th century, with the slave, which the slaves practiced proudly and ostentatiously at the beginning of the, and sorry, at the beginning of the 19th, not 18th. Today it's part of Brazil's intangible cultural heritage and enjoys increasing popularity around the world. I leave out something here. So next, um, point is discourse and repression. Once, um, people or once water carriers are doing all these things at the fountains, they go into the discourse, the public discourse, the administration discourse. Before, they, uh, the discourse was not about them. They were private property, and we know about the number of um, um, slaves being imported from Africa, of the number of slaves 
certain person ha persons had because of testaments and so on, but they were private property. They were not, they had no life, no political life. They only come into this um, public discourse with this, what they are doing here. And they don't leave the public discourse until the abolition of slavery. Then they disappear from public discourse, even as black people. So there is a silencing and then they only came in now in the very late um, time. Um, yeah, there are interesting things here, <laughs> which I won't say. The second argument is repression comes in here. So because of the being thought of as a, as a threat, um, there, um, they install guards. I always already talked about the guards. Um, and a public repression system becomes installed. Um, and I have a picture. Ah, this is the same picture. Here is um, the public repression. And he is, as, as often as these fountain scenes are depicted, nearly as often there is the guard at the fountain scene who, who do, does something, who disciplines. Um, black people fighting there. So this is very much matched. Um, and interestingly, I, I already have talked about the governor of um, Bahia Montero and um, saying that they were jogando, um, joga, they were, um, yeah, they had this play. Um, he also says that um, th this I will read because I, I'm not so as we saw Governor um, Vaya Montero doubted early on that the actions of the slaves at the fountain were as problematic as the city council in, where he doubted that they were as problematic as the city council implied in his opinion the guarda, the guards um, were not only expensive, but also totally useless. If the royal magistrate, the Ovidor, said otherwise, he was only trying to preserve the appearance that he cared about the people. So what, um, in, in this way, the governor not only disputed the aggressiveness of, of, at the, of the fountain users, but at the same time, he questioned the functionality of, the, of a central office within the political order of the Ovidor, who was a high standing um, a person in, in, in bureaucracy. To be sure, this was only one of many points um, in the contention between this governor and the city council that contributed to the emergence of a local government crisis. Um, and ultimately, the government, uh, the governor had to go, was removed. The city council won this and there was um, the, the king sent a new governor because this this wasn't um, working anymore. Nonetheless, this incident, the appropriation in this incident, the appropriation of public space at the fountain by the black population clearly had a political impact um, that affected not only the black population themselves, but the entire city. The retention of the guard shows that the whites felt, in fact, threatened by what was happening at the fountains. Even if it was not so much physical danger as a loss of control over public space and its cultural configuration. Then in 1808, the court comes and they install a, a upgraded police on the model of the Lisbon one, this upgraded police is in the mandate. It's um, they have to um, watch out for foreigners coming from the French Revolution because they are seen as the big danger. In the mandates, nothing is said about a black danger or that the police should have a vigilance over the black population. But that's what they do, in fact. And we have statistics about the arrest the police is doing in this early time, in the um, between 1810 and 1821. And the police is not only able to arrest, but also um, can um, pass sentences and impose penalties on minor offenses. 80% of uh, the um, convicted in these arrests by the police, 80% were slaves and another 90 former slaves. So 99% of them were either slaves or former slaves. And yeah, I have a 
another quote um, for whites, um, this did not apply. So the police never was interested in any white criminals or law did not apply to them. Um, and they were especially arrested for capoeira, which I mentioned before, and punished for that 50 to 300 lashes. If, if everything, anybody is interested in that 50 to 300, once you are caught with capoeira, apart from jail terms. So to my knowledge, no research has yet been done to determine whether and in what form the contract, uh, the contact with the police and tendency had an influence on the lawsuits. That's a missing link here. Mm -hmm. There may well have been overlaps between the two phenomena. After all, the publicness of repression might have motivated fountain users to also use the public judicial system to set the record straight on their behalf and demand justice. As I argued in the first section, although their influence should not be overestimated, slaves promoted the professionalization and legislation and eh, the professionalization of legislation and jurisdiction by demanding justice. Here now I explained that they also promoted the professionalization of the public ordinance of ex uh, repression. Apart from the fact that they thus, the slaves thus contributed in multiple ways to the development of modern statehood, they also strengthened their role as legal subjects, a status that eventually morphed into that of citizens. Their increasingly close meshed integration into the polity, which I have insinuated, did not take place because the slaves or their owners intended it, but because the public sphere seems to operate or, or to have operated in an integrative and self-reinforcing manner. But also because of the slaves, each pursuing his or her own goals repeatedly became creative with their everyday practices. And um, yeah, there is a conclusion. Can we, I think I really read it because it answers to the question of the, of the workshop. Can the concept of momentum then explain the historical transformation that led Brazil from a slaveholding society to a liberal state of citizens? Is it able to convince even those who do not believe that slaves had sufficient agency to achieve the enactment of the consequential free womb law of 1871, which Shaloup suggested? My answer, the con concept at least debunks the objection that the evolution was not due to the slaves because they did not intend such development. So intention goes out. It, it's not near that slaves intend to become citizens um, for they becoming citizens. After all, the appeal of the concept of momentum, for me at least, lies precisely in explaining unintended change. However, the importance of the steps toward the abolition of slavery should not be overestimated either. For as noted before, Shaloub himself made clear in his later works that a sharp distinction between slavery and freedom was illusory and that the abolition represented a milestone in the modern state narrative of progress rather, in a, rather than in a de facto and end to exploitative living and working conditions. The black population may have changed laws, but that did not make the ruling class accountable for the infraction of that, these laws. So it was not um, a state of, of law. Um, before the abolition, individual, where I know literature better, uh, individuals guilty of illegal enslavement generally um, em enjoyed impunity. So the slaves got um, some rights and um, th this was implemented, but that did not mean that the, um, the people who were um, the criminals, in fact, who did this illegal enslavement, they did not get punished. After the abolition, this is very probably, um, this continued. Thus, the abolition of slavery was more a change in frame of reference than in power relations. To be sure, I have tried to show the transition from slavery to citizenship can, at least in part, be traced back to the practices of the slaves, who continually gave new impetus to a momentum of the public sphere by which they themselves were again motivated to act um, in this way, but the transition was primarily a discursive transition. Sorry for expanding my talk.